So in this week's episode of the Fit for Tomorrow podcast, I wanted to sit down with Phil Weigel of CrossFit CLE and Kara Barton uh, with Fit for Function, occupational therapist with Fit for Function. And we wanted to talk a little bit about Phil's journey with CrossFit and endurance sports. So for those of you that don't know Phil, um, he has been in the CrossFit game for for many years and he's competed at a very high level, is one heck of an athlete. Um, But recently he's gotten more into the endurance game and it started with this Murph challenge where he did a Murph every day for a year. And some of those days were multiple Murphs. Uh, It culminated with a 24 hour Murph. We think he did 11 Murphs in a single day. And then it's led into rucking and, and cyclocross and, and Phil and Kara do some tandem bike events. And so I'm intrigued by this relationship between what he has done in CrossFit and now what he is doing in endurance. And um, in any case, I think it was a great conversation. Uh, there's definitely going to be future conversations as, as we always look to, to learn more from each other. But um, anyway, I hope you guys enjoy uh, in this week's episode of the Fit for Tomorrow podcast. Like if we're going to super focus, we got to pick like a... So why don't, why don't you, why don't you pick, what do you think is most interesting to hear from my perspective? Because programming, I don't think is it. My belief on programming is do hard work and vary it enough that you don't get hurt. Like it doesn't need to be magical. That's probably it's, the truth. It's <laughs> I mean, it means simple, end right? Podcast. Just end it. Done. It. So people, people don't, yeah, you don't want to hear my thoughts on programming. No, I was actually listening to one this morning on programming. It was for hypertrophy and mm-hmm. going to fail. It was the, the, so the conversation was how close to failure do you go? And the guy's argument was that if you stay two to four reps shy of failure, you won't get the fatigue that you would get if you went to failure. And so your recovery will be quicker. So that, that was his recommendation. It was kind of interesting. Yeah, but, uh, but isn't that also relative? Because what if what if the set to failure is a set of seven reps or a set of 72 reps? I mean, now we're talking about very different degrees so that those two reps are measuring if you're leaving yep. them on the table or you're doing them. So the, the he suggested, I can't even, Dr. Israel something, I can't even think of his name. He suggested a uh, rep oh, range. Israel. Yeah, maybe. A rep range between five and 30. Uh, five, five and 30 or five and 40. <laughs> So under five would be pure strength, right? Like, yeah. which makes yeah. sense. It's going to be a strength yeah. neural thing. And then um, his argument with you went above 30 or 40 is you're just doing all those reps to get to a point where you'll fatigue. So it's a waste of time, kind of, so to speak. Yeah, then you become an endurance athlete. Right. Because more than 30 reps is endurance. <laughs> right. I mean, it's interesting. It's no, interesting. I mean, it's, but, but my, my point is, like, if, if I'm measuring a set of seven being, complete fatigue or a set of 27 being complete fatigue, then those two reps mean a lot different in, in, in those scenarios, right? Because doing two more reps with what I can only do for seven and doing two more reps with what I can do for 27 is, is, a, is a very different loading and a very different strain. Right. So if the conversation was hypertrophy, what's better? Um, well, I, I've never really done much hypertrophy work, but everything that I've, I've heard and read, um, especially from, from the people who've been on top of the bodybuilding world mm-hmm. is that kind of like 15 to 25 reps. Yeah. So I will, I will say that does sound like it's very much in that ballpark. Um, yeah. These guys are body bodybuilder people. Yeah, that's there. Yeah. Five seems way low, but, I agree. but um, yeah, 15 to 25 reps and going to complete failure is what is what well what the people who stand on the best of of that business say but they also are juiced to the tips so that's the that's the rub right yeah yeah and that makes sense if you're arguing the the repeatability and the recovery of it because without without that increase in testosterone your recovery is a different animal yeah yeah interesting Hmm. I, well, send me uh, send me a link to that. Now I want to I want to hear that. <laughs> <laughs> it was pretty. I mean, it was actually pretty interesting. Um, yeah. Like I said, they're yeah, coming from a bodybuilding perspective. Perspective. Well, and that's the thing. Like that. That's so specific when you're talking about hypertrophy of specific muscle groups and how you have to isolate them and do that. This is general fitness. I mean, move around, vary your stuff, mm-hmm. do it at the highest intensity that's reasonable and safe and recover reasonably and you, you get better and you stay fit and you stay well it's right. not rocket science different beast yeah um i i wonder if you could combine the theories like could you do a day or 
three, you know, two days a week of functional fitness, two days a week of bodybuilding. And would that maximize your progress so that you get a little bit of both worlds or would it be a disaster because you don't get enough progress in either side? I th- a lot, I feel like a lot of CrossFit gyms actually do that. I, I think it has its, it's a lot do. Well, oh, I, well, I, I should say a group of them do. Yeah. It, it's definitely gotten a lot more popular in the competition scene. Um, but there's also the note that in the competition scene, there's a lot more vanity and a lot more Instagram posting. So you got to have big biceps well, to get the likes. And- yes. And no, I think <laughs> a lot of people, a lot, even a lot of your members join CrossFit because they want to look better. Yeah. Yeah. But, but, and therefore gyms are starting to program that way. And a lot of, you're big, saying uh, standard gyms, you're saying it more. In CrossFit gyms too. Yeah. I, I'm standard. CrossFit yeah. Yeah. So, but even. General. A lot of the big CrossFit programmers are coming out with like mayhem. They're coming out with like bodybuilding programming now. Yeah, a competition based platform. Yeah. That's my point. Yeah. Where you're gonna get the people who want to be on Instagram. Yeah. Um so do you so think I, it's do you think it's aesthetics or do you think it's like functional? Yeah. No. There's there is functionality, but to a fairly limited degree. Um, mm-hmm. from what I've found with working with people you don't need to get bigger to get stronger. Most of the time, muscles are just poorly conditioned to do any work. Right. And you can very quickly get them to adapt the cardiovascular strain and to work with that, their, their new constraints around oxygen uh, under, under stress and load. And also you can, at the same time, just stepping into the weight zone, you can, you can increase the capacity to move large loads without, without making a huge change in muscle size. Yeah, um, no, I, I agree with you. I don't think hypertrophy, to some degree, I'm sure it does, but by and to, large. To a degree. Like, if I want to squat 500 pounds, I got to get bigger, but I don't want to squat 500 pounds. I'm okay squatting 360 and being able to run mm-hmm. and do the other thing. So once you get into that, I got to be bigger to do a thing, well, you're going to lose in other aspects. And so that's real specific. For most people, it's more of, I need to change the other parts of my body than I need to make my muscles be big. Right. You know, that's most of what fitness seems to be from people coming in. Yeah. Um, in my experience. Yeah. I'm curious about it from the metabolic side. Like, uh, I've been doing a ton of reading on the insulin resistance stuff. Mm-hmm. And they're, they're talking about taking muscles to failure to get into that mitochondrial activation and that kind of stuff. Um, so mm-hmm. that's, that's what's led me down this kind of looking at it um are there metabolic for somebody with metabolic dysfunction are there benefits like if you have insulin resistance if you are overweight if you're doing that kind of stuff what's yeah, the difference between you'd have, to do, you'd have to do some very specific study on that to, to understand that well that's yeah i'm interested but that'd in be that. fascinating to do and chances are somebody who falls in that group is not doing they're not in the gym so doing a little bit of exercise is going to be beneficial. Oh yeah. I mean, anything, anything's going to work, but if you like, is it more optimal? Yeah. 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 Can you, can you tweak it, make it perfect? Yeah. It is the season for the random person to walk in. That's never been in a gym and and tries to do the gym. What's the, what's the workout for them? That's like, I think if you're skipping the functional fitness side, that's a disservice, right? If you're just doing a body build split. Yeah. Um, but if there's advantages to improve the way they utilize energy, well, it's interesting. Yeah. It's interesting. Yeah. I would have to understand those pathways to a much greater degree to have a lot of confidence putting that as a, as a block of the program. Yeah. Um, Cause right now I know that strength training works, not specifically hydro or hypertrophy training, but um training to optimize the amount of force that a muscle can put out. So it's shorter sets, um, longer rest between them, you know, seven sets of three or five with three minute breaks between them, enough time to recover and really move heavy loads, um, but not go to complete failure. Once you start going to complete failure on a regular basis, then you also start accruing a lot of risk as far as how you move the joint itself, right? If I, if I do back squats to failure, that's, that's not a good idea. A leg press to failure is a different thing, but I don't have a leg press machine, right? You know, um, so that that's another place where I'd have to. Well, what's I'd the, have to be careful about what we used on it? Yeah, and then what's the weekly consequence of taking a back squat to failure? Like that's going to yeah. shoot your your system's going to be fried for seven days. 
the the CNS for sure. That's what I mean. I mean yeah. Like, and, and that's where I think you, you, we're talking about different things. Bodybuilders isolate. They do mm-hmm. a single muscle group for a specific purpose. We're using the whole thing, right? Mm-hmm. A power clean. I can't tell you what it uses. All of you, if you do it right, <laughs> right? It's just it's too complex to say. Let's isolate and fail at this. And yeah, I mean, I, I just think the functionality of of broad movement is a little bit a little bit too big for that type of isolation style training. But it would be really interesting to see if it actually makes a notable change in how the metabolic pathway is followed. Yeah. The, the theory I, be, and, and I don't, I don't, I don't have this fully understood as well, but the theory is that there's non-insulin specific uh, glucose receptors in the muscle and exercise specifically things that activate the mitochondria trigger that. So the, the lower intensity stuff, you can start to absorb glucose without needing insulin. So even somebody that is having issues with insulin production or insulin resistance can still get glucose out of their bloodstream effectively. So they're using these, the exercise to basically replace insulin sensitivity. Hmm. Um, and that, that sounds, yeah, that sounds really fascinating. It's, it's but, intriguing. But also, but, but also that sounds like a combined nutritionist and like an approach for three people to be doing at once with a single client yeah as no to it's myself trying to make somebody <laughs> better <with laughs> and, and nick you're saying that's only at lower intensity i think they're i think most of the stuff i've done is there it's the cardio is done at what they call like zone two cardio so where you're not putting you're not getting lactate accumulation um yeah. and then the resistance training um you know, the research is all over the place, but the people talking about it are talking about taking the muscle towards a, a failure state with longer reps and stuff. But not more than 30. Well, then well this, then. Yeah, this was a different <laughs> comment. This was, this wasn't had nothing to do with insulin. This was just guys talking about hypertrophy, but, um, uh, oh, so those are... the bodybuilder guys were not talking about insulin. I'm, I found the bodybuilder guys cause I'm looking at this rep to failure stuff. But the rep to failure stuff has potential benefit on the metabolic. The metabolic, yeah, that's yeah, that's okay. my that's my that's personal curiosity. That's not uh, well, and so I wonder how do you have to reach full failure? Because if you look at people doing CrossFit workouts, you get close all the time, I, right? Right. So I don't. I wonder where that line is because built into that intensity, if I give you forty handstand pushups, you hit a wall at twenty five, and, and you're now done. you're trickling your way through, but you still have that ridiculously high heart rate. You're, you're building uh, a ton of fatigue in those muscles and, and you're, you're still working through that, that kind of near failure zone. So I wonder, I wonder what kind of turnover benefit that has. Right. So, I mean, if you're just looking at it from an energy metabolism standpoint, is there a difference between a seven minute, you know, AMRAP that smokes you compared yeah. to an hour in the kind of doing bodybuilding splits? What's the difference? Obviously, I think you're talking different energy systems, but what would happen from insulin, blood glucose, that kind of stuff? We need to get somebody all stuck up with with uh, constant monitors so we can just yeah. I I wore one for a while. I had one on for yeah. a couple months, but I've the problem is yeah. The problem is that it doesn't tell you what your insulin's doing. I, I know. So it just does glucose. Right. But what you don't know is how much insulin you're dumping to maintain is, that glucose. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is what your response is to the glucose. Yeah. Right. So all I learned is I, I don't have diabetes, yeah. right? I don't have diabetes. <laughs> I can keep it. I can keep it here. Well, that's good. Good job. But, <laughs> but I don't know if I'm on the path, right? I don't know yeah. where you're at on the path to diabetes. So yeah, uh, it, yeah it's interesting. Can we put Josh through some... Uh testing once he gets his insulin pump <laughs> you have to pre-fill those with insulin you have to guess so, how much insulin um like he would be taking in a day i wonder if we just start putting less and less insulin in <laughs> we'll see if he's still alive at the end of the day did i talk to you about that did i talk to you about that cycling yeah. podcast the san indigo no he he has a cycling group they're all type 1 diabetics oh and- cool and one guy on that group, I think his insulin's down to next to nothing. He does three hours of zone two a day. And he's just able to Let's, maximize that non-insulin dependent oh, uptake. 
what I was going to um, kind of add, because I, I, I know for Josh, if he starts doing, like, say, like, he takes, like, a bit off of working out, he starts doing CrossFit again, his, like, his blood sugars will just start dropping at, you know, insane. Uh, insane. Like, just, like, in the middle of the night, in the middle of the day, it takes about a week or so to start regulating again. If he goes and does more of bodybuilding splits, we did that, um, what was that, in fall or so? Um, we were doing that about four times a week. Um, that didn't happen, which was really interesting. They, um, they, they talked about that mechanism on that podcast, and um, I, I don't remember the details. Is it just because the muscle glycogen is so depleted it needs to dump back in it, does it in the middle of the night? It has something to do with that, yes. Yeah. Mm, yeah. That's something to, I can't remember exactly how it, the details of it. And, and actually, so to this week, he started adding endurance stuff back in. Let's see, Monday, he just swam for a half hour and during swimming, his blood sugar did drop, um, but did not drop after, after, um, does, like during the day or at night. Does and he then, go up? Does he go up during a CrossFit style workout? Like, does he it's release less, enough glycogen that his blood sugar goes up during CrossFit? No. So I if I rem- not, that, not that I'm aware yeah. of. I we, think to, to what Phil was saying, if I remember correctly, the argument was the high intensity stuff, you mobilize a lot of glucose and then you have to inject insulin to get that glucose back down, but it's too much because you got this sensitivity thing going on and then it tanks. No, typically he's tanking. Yeah. It was something um, along those lines. I can't remember the exact. Yeah. But I, yesterday he biked, you know, I, I, I mean, I should take a look at his heart rate. My guess would be zone two because he did it for an hour. He's, he's not able to sustain that at anything above zone two. Um, he did, his blood sugar stayed very constant through the day. And then tomorrow's running, I believe, for an hour. Same thing. He won't be able to do that more than the zone two. Mm. So, uh, you know, we'll see, we'll see what happens. Yeah. Interesting. Ah, just curiosity. Yeah. Now you can see the full logo. Oh, goodness. <laughs> By the end of the podcast, he's going to have his t-shirt off. <laughs> <laughs> Any excuse. That, yeah, that picture that we, <laughs> hey, that, that you picture we posted, <laughs> the, the NRT one that got posted of Kara cupping your legs and your shirts off. Like if we're working on, if that was a lab, a leg lab, why was your shirt off? <laughs> I do what I'm told. <laughs> well, I feel like I have a injury. All right, keep your shirt off. I guess we'll uh, take a look at it. <laughs> <laughs> I was trying to figure that out. I was like, why is this shirt off? Good for the gram. <laughs> My shoes were off for some reason. I mean, there was... <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you're getting comfortable yeah so if we just switch that to overtrain like i guess the question if we're talking about energy systems right from this metabolic stuff anyway um yeah how do you coordinate your endurance work with crossfit work poorly um (laughs) for the most part i've found that i just kind of segment them out and i am either doing one pretty pretty consistently or i'm doing the other um, so currently I'm trying to mesh the two a little bit more effectively because I want to maintain general fitness a little bit better this year as I still keep building that endurance space. Um, but it, I get caught up in how much time I have to spend on my feet, especially because my events are, are long distance rucks. Um, and there's no substitute for having 40 pounds on your back and just having those foot strikes. And that's the biggest issue for me in racing is. I'm going to pound my feet against that pavement or the dirt, whatever the surface is for just hours and hours and hours. And if my joints aren't conditioned for that impact, then I have a miserable time very quickly. And it's, and it's just incredibly hard to grit your way through a race when all of your joints hurt within the first couple hours. So for me, it's getting in a lot of longer distance rucks. Um, for instance, in preparation for, uh, for a 15th, well, I was prepping for a hundred miler um, and I ended up stopping at 50 this year. In preparation for that, I worked my way, <clears throat> excuse me, I worked my way all the way up to a marathon um, with 40 pounds on my back. And in that week that I did that marathon, I also did another three days over 10 miles. 
So in a week I rucked, I rucked more than the equivalent of what I ended up racing. Um, I think I was at like 75 miles that week. And realistically, I wanted to be at a hundred miles that week to be better prepped to go into a hundred mile race. But you think about the time that takes, I'm averaging 13 to 15 miles an hour, depending on terrain. Mm -hmm. I mean, you go for a marathon at that pace, you're looking at five to six hours. And it's just, I had a lot of trouble getting in my volume on my feet and being able to do anything else. Um, so this year I'm trying to figure out how do I train my, my big sets, my endurance days, um, where I have to do two to seven hours of, of endurance, um, steady sort of work and also do my high intensity days and I'm doing a better job at it, but it's just, I have to, I have to make a deliberate effort to do it. I, right now I'm kind of scheduling a day with Daryl where, where I do conditioning with him. So I, yesterday we did hands or two days ago, we did handstand pushups and then a high intensity workout for 15 minutes. Um, then when like I got home, Metcon yeah. style. Yeah. Yeah. Wall ball shots, Kirby box overs, um, nothing too heavy, but a lot of intensity for a 15 minute window. Mm-hmm. And then when I got home, I did a hero workout, um, 45 minute, just steady grind of body weight movement, lower intensity, a lot more duration and repetition. Um, so I got in kind of both sides of the spectrum to a minor degree because I didn't do a giant weightlifting day. I didn't pick up a bunch of really heavy stuff. And I also didn't do a four hour window. So I got a little bit of both. And that's kind of how I'm trying to balance it right now. If I have a day where I have to do a lot of one thing, I'm probably not going to do much of the other, if at all. Um, or I'm going to have days where I have kind of a, a light balance of the two. How's uh, your, but how's your body handling that? Like at first, terribly, the first couple of CrossFit workouts are just, are just brutal because the conditioning of my muscles currently, um, especially my legs is small range of motion. If you think about running, it is not a very big, especially well, rucking, hiking more or mm-hmm. less. It's really small steps. I'm not doing big giant strides. There's no deep hip range of motion, right? It's, it's pretty limited range of motion. So then when I go to do a wall ball shot um, or some back squats, I can tell that my muscles are not used to going through that range with load. And I get really sore um, for the first two weeks of doing something like that before, before my body is okay with doing the high intensity and those aggressive reps. Um, I never really have a problem with the endurance with the long steady stuff, Mm -hmm. except for if I haven't done any of it and then I go right into it and do a 10 miler, I'll, I'll feel the pain in the joints. Um, but muscle wise endurance doesn't bother me at all. Um, the longer stuff doesn't, it's, it's just joint discomfort. Um, that kind of goes for the bike too. When, when we do long stuff on the bike, man, you, you gotta, Sometimes you just have a bad day and, and, and stuff's going wrong with your back. Well, mostly or your bike. <laughs> or your bike. Mostly that's because I, I deadlifted heavy and then got on the bike. But they decided to cross it for the first time a week before a 100 mile race. And the whole time I had to listen to him about his, help, his back hurting. I was like, ah. <laughs> I, I felt that I was pretty well recovered from that. I felt fine. But then I got on the bike and things were too stiff. Um, but typically, you think on it was the bike, stiff or fatigued? Both. Both. Yeah. I just yeah. Yeah. Cause I definitely was missing range of motion and the muscles felt okay, but they, they would have still been fatigued because I had lifted pretty heavy three days earlier and I hadn't been doing a lot of heavy deadlifting. So, I mean, that was a specific mistake that I made before a race, but very often in bike races, it'll come down to whether or not my knees are okay with continuing to put out that amount of a strain for another hour. And if I've been biking enough, they're okay. If I haven't, then it's kind of like that, that rucking idea where you've got all those foot strikes. You have to be conditioned to take that impact again and again. And when you say knees, you're talking like, it feels like joint, joint pain, um, or like in the knee joint. It's or- a tracking issue. I think, um, it, I, I end up going a little bit, uh, I flare out a little bit with my left knee. So my that same left gets- knee nonsense. Yeah. Yeah. Yep, exactly. The IT band's tight and it pulls it out and the VMO gets pissed off because it's fighting it the other way. And, and then I end up with a hot knee and it develops in different spots. Most of the time it's kind of on that uh, inside of that patellar shelf um, or not patellar, uh, tibial shelf. 
um, kind of inside that patella or to the medial side of the patella, if you will. Yeah. Um, I don't normally get pain on the outside of the knee, but the, the inside of that left knee is still always a little bit of a thorn in my side. Yeah. I've been, again, I've been watching more content on the bodybuilder side. And the one thing that I think is interesting <clears throat> is they do a lot of uh, different angled lifts, right. To try to target, get different parts of the muscle to, to take the force. Right. Yeah. And I think it brings up, like you see this knees over toes guy on YouTube talking about changing knee positions and all this kind of stuff. And it brings up an interesting question or theoretical thought. Like we spend so much time from a performance standpoint, like when you squat or you deadlift, you want your back in this position, your knee in this position, your foot in this position, because that's the best position to do the lift. Yeah. Does it make us the most durable? Like, could you spend time training, training that knee in or knee out with a controlled environment, controlled force, all that kind of stuff to make those different angles stronger. Um, so that when you, when you start to fatigue, you don't end up in a bad spot. So I think definitely yes. Um, and, and one of the ways that we kind of go about that in, in our uh, program with CrossFit is to use more free weight, right? To add, to add the ability of the weight to change direction so that you have to work to stabilize it. So we're not necessarily mm -hmm. approaching a press from a new angle, but we're adding, uh, we're adding some instability to the press to force muscles to adapt to do a better job of holding it, right? Mm -hmm. So like doing a bottoms up kettlebell press is significantly harder in terms of the stabilization than doing a standard dumbbell press. Right. Um, so we try to work that in a little bit, but it's definitely not as, we're not targeting a specific angle of a muscle in order to do a specific bit of hypertrophy. But right. I think that has a, a lot of benefit for the rehab setting. Um, I think it's just a little bit too specific for the general program that we have. Right. Yeah. I mean, I've been looking at it from our right on the rehab side of, yeah, look, if your VMO is that weak, we got to, you know, we got to put you in positions where maybe it gets stronger and then also figure out what's <laughs> happening at the hip or the foot that you're never going to that spot in the first place. Like, I think, you know, that obviously it opens a whole can of worms. Um, yeah. But it, I mean, it's interesting, right? It's an interesting type of, uh, if somebody's so like, say they've been walking a certain way for, you know, 10 years and you correct that hip position, but there's so much atrophy in the quad or it's not weak or the motor pattern's not there. How do you actually get them to utilize that new pattern? Right. Um, do you actually need specific hypertrophy work to get it? Um, I think it's, a, it's an a, interesting thought. So, yeah. If the discrepancy is big enough, then I'd say, yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. You know, cause we can see obviously with manual therapy and stuff, you see these changes of, you know, your knee goes this far now it goes, you know, twice as far. But can yeah. you, what do you need to hold that? Like, yeah. is it? How do you make that stay? And so that you actually have the ability to, to utilize that range of motion. Mm -hmm. um, and do, what's, what's the, I think is in the PT world, it's always like, oh, do three sets of 10 or do a couple of sets to it gets a little tired. Like, what is the actual conditioning range? Like, can we get better at training that range of motion? Um, because like you're saying with a bike, it's so specific, like mm. nothing, there's, there's, there's less carryover between movements than I would like to believe, you mm. know what I mean? Like being, being a hell of a CrossFitter isn't going to necessarily translate to the, to some degree, it's going to translate to the bike, but you're not going to be the best cyclist, right? Like it's nice. the specificity. It's so for one, hard. for one, you'll be way too heavy. Like that. <laughs> 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 right. I mean, like, this is crazy. So the yeah. next thing, like, I think this is uh, to tie into kind of what you're doing with CrossFit in the bike. How, um, how do you pick, uh, what is your goal for the year? And then how do you tr train that way? Um, so I guess where I'm, I'm trying to lead this to is specializing in a performance thing versus just general fitness. So you're asking me a question that leads me into things that I'm going to do rather than things that I have done. Because for the last okay. two years, I've really just approached this as general base building. Um, that's in part, that's part of what Murph became doing it for a year was just building a base of being ready to, to do monotonous things and not have a problem with them. 
also mm -hmm. built a base of a lot of running with weight, uh, a lot of push-ups, pull-ups, and squats, just, you know, functional movements that humans need to do. You got to mm -hmm. be able to run and climb up the tree. And that kind of leads you into being able to do a lot of that stuff. Um, this year, I have a lot of bike races uh, that, that we're set up for. So tick, um, Kara and I ride a tandem bike and we've got a 125 miler that has 14,000 feet of elevation in it. And that is going to be the hardest bike thing I've ever done. Um, it, it's, it, it's did a you, lot. Did you guys do a hundred earlier this year? We did a hundred, but it was flatter. flatter. Yeah. It was up in Michigan. This is in central Ohio and it's just hills. It's just mm -hmm. rolly little hills. Um, and a lot of them for a long time. I'm taking off of work that week. I think I'm already going to be injured. <laughs> so for this year, I'd say I have some more specific, um, some more specific things like I know that race is going to be incredibly difficult and I have to prepare more diligently on a bike be so because Kara's not going to prepare you have to be more prepared <laughs> I, I definitely care much more than him she always is more prepared than me well bike prepared I'm, yeah she's always more she's always more bike prepared than I am yeah. uh, I think it'd be safe to say I come in with a better level of general fitness uh -huh. Okay. And then between the two of us, we both have plenty of problems on the day because <laughs> shit just, it's going to go south at some point when you're on a bike for, I mean, that race, I'm thinking that's probably going to be close to 15 hours for us. Yeah, probably. And yeah. So think about it. Think about just sitting now sitting. I don't want to be in a car for saddle, 15 hours. Yeah. Now sitting on an uncomfortable saddle and yeah. pedaling up and down hills. So and we have to agree on the same cadence so we have yeah. to. So it's like, to, and like, it's a lot easier on your own bike because you can mess around, you can stand up, you can do all sorts of stuff, but we have to come to some sort of central agreement on what we're doing. What we're <laughs> <laughs> so, so this year I, I'm going to be scheduling out um, a day a week where I'm specifically training a bike for longer periods to most of it, honestly, is just getting my pedal right. If I, if I don't pedal right, then I'm going to have knee problems. If I'm not used to sitting on the saddle, I'm going to have groin problems and that's going to lead to knee problems and back problems. So it's just kind of giving yourself enough exposure to the thing uh, to at least get through it in a functional manner and not limp across that finish line. And that's, that's such a big race, Nick. I think that that's my goal is to, is to cross that line well, rather than to do what I I know how to do because I, I can. I've done it plenty of times, but I'm I'm getting tired of limping across finish lines because Anyways. because I just <laughs> I just went for it and I thought yeah it's probably true and I do have enough fitness to get through this and it's going to become a grit issue rather than can I perform well and I'm trying to kind of turn that page over and work on being better prepared to perform at specific things and in this case I think it really just comes down to me being on the on a bike about four hours a week because traditionally I'm on a bike maybe 30 minutes a week. Um, and that's, and that's just, and you don't yeah. to bike. that's little, and that's, that's less, that's less than I thought you were going to say. Well, and that's, and that's the what thing. Would, I, I, what would somebody just training cycling? Like only ride a bike. Yeah. yeah they, but well, how many hours a week are they putting in? They're putting in four to nine. We know people who ride bikes nine hours a week. Easily. At least. Yeah. Maybe yeah, I 12. Was I was thinking I mean, it might be more than that. Yeah. Some people like our cycling teammates, because we are on a cycling team <laughs> with people who actually cycle all the time. They right. basically just live on their bikes. If they're doing any conditioning, it's bike based. Yeah. They might do a tiny bit of, of lifting or, or body movement yeah. to try to have a stronger core um, and little things that go into helping them on the bike. But 90% of their times on the bike. Yeah. In the winter time, you'll see more cyclists, maybe twice a week, do some sort of yeah. uh, squatting or kettlebell slash core work. But as soon as it slightly gets warmer out, they're stopping mm -hmm. that again. So, mm -hmm. and neither of us is trying to be the best cyclist, right? We're, we're trying to get through what are really aggressive races on a tandem bike and, and just have a good time doing it basically, because it's, it's a miserable thing. Um, <laughs> if, you, if you can't enjoy yourself, it's, you don't do it. Yeah. But, but a lot of the people who are competing in cycling, I mean, they're, they're competing. It's kind of different than how we're approaching these events. And also the same with how I rock. Like 
I'm doing a 50 mile race against people who are 80 pounds lighter than me and not carrying 25 pounds on their back. I'm not competing against them. I'm out there to try to do my thing, which is complete a large task with high difficulty and high monotony in a respectable time or whatever it is for that event, or just meet a time cap. I mean, some, sometimes I literally set my ruck weight to see if I can finish a race or get cut. <laughs> like, we just signed up for our first race for this year, which is in, is that, is that April? I think it's March? end of April. End of April. Yeah. And, I hope so. there, <laughs> and we, we asked if we could bring it to bring the tandem. There, the response um, that that guy gave as, as, well, as well as many others that have done it in the past, many other organizers have responded to us in the past is uh like, well, you'll, you can totally bring it, but you're definitely going to be the first tandem team to <laughs> come out and do this. Yeah. <laughs> Got it. <laughs> yeah. Everyone thinks we're nuts and they're not wrong. I, yeah. I, I don't know how or why you've decided to do that, but it's interesting. Well, the best part, we almost had, um, Cause, at, cause misery loves company. <laughs> it's a, yeah. Yeah. Uh, when we went out to Barry Bay in the 62 miler division, there was actually what? There's like 14 tandems, like which it was more than that, but there was a lot. There was yeah. a lot of tandems, like which it was just a funny amount of tandems, really. Yeah. But then of course we emailed the guys and said, can we do the 107 miler? <laughs> <laughs> and he was like, Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> yeah, he told us we wouldn't get any prize, but we could do it. We'd be the first tandem to do it. So we did. There you go. Yeah. Might as well be the first. <laughs> be yeah. first or last. So you saw it. I think that answered your question more or less. Well, I, I know personally, um, because like you know, Phil, I typically ride my bike more than he does. I, at this point in my life, because I, I would say in prior years, um, and I think this was is more this part is more of a personality trait of I would become a little bit more focused on one specific um, sport. So I would do that sport more often, whereas now I am trying to blend um, cycling and weightlifting better. So, you know, ideally I would. I'm gonna up most. I'm not signed up yet, but I plan on lifting at the American Open in March. But then I, with that in mind, I need to be also ready by June to go do um, the bump bottom, which is the 125 miler. Um, but then all, we also then had that race at the end of April. Yeah. So pers- I, I typically alternate, like, um, if I'm at, you know, weightlifting, you know, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, then I'm on my bike, um, Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, uh, but of course life happens too. So a lot of times I end up having to double up on Saturday, but I'll weightlift first before I go ride my bike. So that because I'd rather be tired going into a bike ride than tired going into weightlifting. Because yeah. at the end of the day, I'm going to be tired during the race, and I still need to be able to ride my bike. Yep. Yeah, I mean, you couldn't be two different extremes of the energy demands, like weightlifting versus cycling, like two totally separate challenges. Did you guys do that on purpose? No. Like from a preparedness stand, like a general fitness preparedness. Like, are you asking? Did I pick cycling and weightlifting on purpose? Yeah, like they sports. did because she, she's afraid of CrossFit. She doesn't want to be I, wow. <laughs> I was like, oh, I don't really want to do CrossFit. Wow. <laughs> no, I, um, I've been riding bikes for a while. Um, it's probably been, I don't know, what, nine years now? Yeah, um, years. Started riding in college. Yeah. Uh, I, I used to only race road. And after collegiate cycling ended I that's when I first started CrossFit because I was, I was finishing up like clinical rotations and needed to meet somebody in small town West Virginia where they had placed me so I joined my first CrossFit gym and I really <laughs> it's I think it was a newbie mindset like I had a great engine because I had you know been doing clean cycling I could do any CrossFit workout for a long period of time I was you know I had my um I was generally stronger than most females my age uh, because I you know did weight lift a lot um came from a personal training background and I 
found so we were, I'd never had done something like Olympic weightlifting before. So in that CrossFit gym had an, a weightlifting club and I dropped in for the first time. I was like, oh, I really like this. Mm. This is very new to me. So you were, you were attracted to the opposite. Sorry. Yeah. I was, I like the, the difficulty of it because it was something I'd never done before. I'd come from more of like the bodybuilding mindset of, you know, today I'm going to do back and buys, tomorrow I'm going to do legs, then I'm going to do chest and tries. And yeah. I never just, you know, I never had tried to do a snatch before. Yeah. I, the skill of the lift is fun, right? Because it's so not like you're learning a new thing. Yeah. Yeah. Like that skill acquisition piece. But from a training standpoint, like there can't be any Olympic weightlifters that ride a bike as much as you guys and vice versa. Yeah. I definitely, when I first started doing weightlifting, I stopped riding my bike as often um, and focused much more on weightlifting. And at that point I was weightlifting five times a week. And part of that was also, I was moving around a lot at that point in my life. So I had moved to Cleveland, moved back to West Virginia, um, moved back to Cleveland. Didn't, when, when I moved up to Cleveland, didn't know a whole lot of folks um, who were into bikes and until I met Phil and, um, and he had just started getting into bikes. So now you're and on a tandem. Now we're on a tandem. <laughs> Makes, sense. Makes perfect I had, sense. I, I knew one Proper progression. Yeah, you know, a team that I used to be on in West Virginia. There just so happened to be a teammate that lived in Canton. Um, so when I moved up, like we had reconnected and we would ride, but same, you know, we don't, we don't, it's not like we live down the street from each other. So we couldn't ride all the time together, but what do you think are the advantages of both? Like, do you, what, what advantages do you think you find in your cycling because of the, your weightlifting background and CrossFit background? And then vice, you know, the other way around, do you think there's advantages to your cycling on your CrossFit performance or do you think it's two separate? There's definitely strength advantages. Um, I, I found, I think a, a much bigger part of it is more of a, mental strength component what do you mean so and i and i I find this more with you know maybe probably more often cyclocross um but also even in gravel if like if you're doing a more difficult climb of the the mental side of things of being able to finish it and wrapping your mind about over around that because there's i mean there's nothing nothing easy about you know trading for weightlifting either most of weightlifting is is a mental game as well so are you saying that the the extreme exertion you experience in in maximal effort lifting Mm -hmm. gives you confidence when you have a minor exertion that lasts a long time yes okay do you think that's physiologic like i would see like i think crossfitters are probably very good at recovering quickly like clearing lactate like because you're going to build lactate during those intense bursts and then yeah you, you have to get good at clearing that and recovering for the next piece of the workout mm-hmm. that has to carry over to the bike wouldn't it i mean especially when yes. you're pushing certain yeah rates. so i think it certainly can i think i think i think the most effective place that i see it is in cyclocross um because the well, my personal performance, I can see how it carries over. I'm, I'm okay at cyclocross because it's a short window. It's a, it's an hour long sport on the long end. So that Close. is, a, that is an area Close. where I can do intervals for an hour and have an extremely high intensity. And like you said, I have a pretty good adaptation to clear lactic acid because of how we work because of the high intensity interval sets, the, the, the high volume sets that take you to very close to fatigue and give a lot of that lactic acid dump to the muscles. Um, then you have to work through that as you continue to do work. So that, that blends really well for cyclocross in my experience. Um, I haven't found that I'm good at the, at the, <laughs> the real endurance stuff. Um, once we start talking like five, six, 10 hour races, then I don't think that the carryover is as great. I think it's much more dependent on how much time you've spent at 140 beats a minute, tapping it out for five hours. It's about the, about that kind of accumulated um, conditioning to the strain that you're going to be working with for a long period of time. Yeah. Because the tendency is to, to fly out the gate, right? I mean, I'm, I'm used to, I'm used to CrossFit workouts where it's 
you start hot and you stay hot and it's a seven mm-hmm. minute workout. Well, you don't want to start a seven hour race like that. You have to have a much more deliberate approach um, and you have to have a plan for how hard you're pushing it so that you can maintain that push. Um, that's something you only get to understand through experience. And, and you get really humbled your first couple of events because you don't understand your pacing and you go out and you just blow yourself up. And yeah. I've done that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, you have. Um, yeah, I, I think a lot of it is knowing that you're about to be uncomfortable for the next, you know, yeah. eight, nine, 10 hours and just being okay with it. And, and that part, I don't know how much CrossFit helps with that. I think, I think you're just kind of generally good at that better than a lot of people are. Um, I love monotony. I, <laughs> I've, I've worked specifically on being better at it, right? Um, I mean, doing, doing Murph for a year and, and trying to work myself into a state of making that normal rather than monotonous was, was a large part of an exercise and being okay with another five hours on the bike. Yeah. Being okay tapping it out, even though you're uncomfortable and you want to stop, you probably should, but you're not going to. Um, so I don't know how much of that is from CrossFit. I don't think that made me mentally weak, but I think I've done a lot more effective job with a different discipline uh, to build that mental stick to itiveness and that grit. So, so Kara mentioned that she took up weightlifting because it was new, like it was a new thing. It was whatever. It was fun. Do you, yeah. Phil, do you think your into this endurance thing it, because it's new it's different or do you think it's uh you mentioned building a base like do you think it's building the best human or do you think it's like hey this is a new challenge you're trying to take on like where are you at on that um both i think i think even more than that nick my idea is that it's old um so yeah it's, it's a new style of training for me specifically mm-hmm. but it's the oldest thing in the book i mean what did humans have to do forever they had to be able to move themselves long distances they had to adapt to the environment and sometimes that meant you got to go 40 miles to go find food mm-hmm. and and i think that's been the biggest draw for me is is regaining a base level of of human ability that's kind of been lost by the ease of our world right i don't have to i don't have to run to cleveland every day i get in my car and i drive 35 miles mm-hmm. well like that's something I should be capable of doing if I have to do it. And you ask most people, Hey, can you go move on your feet to Cleveland and make it there in in X number of hours? The answer is no, they're not prepared mentally, physically, emotionally, none of it. It doesn't, you didn't have to put a timeline on that. Yeah. Just do it. (laughs) Just 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 do it. it. So for me, a lot of that, this pursuit has been to regain that kind of base, base ability Mm -hmm. that humanity got to this point on we didn't we didn't get to this point because we made smartphones we got to the point where we could make smartphones because we had survived because of our ability to endure and work i mean even even look back 200 years most people survived on manual labor that was Mm -hmm. that was their gig in some way shape or form they were working the land they were working on the land they were soldiers they were i mean it's just every occupation was built around physical exertion find me five occupations that are currently around an appropriate amount of physical exertion to keep a human healthy. It's just, Mm -hmm. our world has changed to such a degree that I think you have to go out and make yourself human. If you want to maintain your ability to do things that your ancestors could. Yeah. So that's a super interesting topic to me. Like what does the ideal what do you call it? Exercise, form, whatever. What, what, what do humans need to be able to do to live the longest, to be functional, have the highest quality of life? Where, yeah. where is that line? What is that? Uh, Cause you're right. I mean, I don't know if you've ever, there's a social media post floating around. I think it was squat university posted or something, but it was like an army position, a shooting position in the army was like this mm-hmm. deep squat where you're in a sitting in a deep squat with your elbows rested on your knees. That was a shooting position that they trained. Like that was, a, you know, this is one of the stable positions you can use how many people can get into a deep squat and sit there for more than 10 seconds, you know, like, uh, and it's just the evolution of how we move. And now I'm seeing in in the rehab world, a 10, 12 year olds that can't touch their toes, can't squat, can't, um, yeah, that, that progression just, it's, it's a little scary. Um, from a, from a movement standpoint, I mean, if you just take, you take a three-year-old. So you've got, you've got newborn, 
newborn child and a new, what, new and a two and a half. Two? Yep, two and a half. Two and a half. Yep. So what's what's her squat look like? Oh, she can do anything she wants. Yeah. Like her movement, she can it nails it. Full freedom. Yeah, full freedom. It's a problem we make for ourselves. Yeah. Right? We have all the capacity, we have all the tools, and then we sit down and we neglect them. Literally, we sit down and neglect mm-hmm. them. And then all of a sudden we wonder why our backs hurt when we move. And yeah. I think it's I'm taking this to the extreme for sure. I'm not doing it at a healthy level. I'm doing it at an extreme kind of investigatory level. I want to see how hard and how far I can push it. Mm -hmm. But I still think it's, it's reaching back to a base level of health that has just been forgotten about. And granted I'm, I'm overreaching and I'm probably creating some damage through this pursuit, but I think in the long run, mentally it's, it's, it's helped me a lot with, with things that I don't even know how to explain. Um, I, 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 you just feel, now this sounds way too Zen, but when, when you've gone, when you've gone and you've, you pushed yourself for, for hours, you can't help, but feel kind of Zen after that. Like you just you mentally, physically, emotionally, you're in a different place because you've, you've gone through this effort and gotten out this energy in such a primal way. I, I don't really even know how to describe it. it. It's just something I've become very connected to. I mean, uh, even after short workouts, like you, you feel different, like your brain's clearer, you know, your, oh, yeah. your thoughts are there. Um, so I can't, yeah. you know, I'm not doing five hour workouts, so I'm, I'm sure it's a totally different beast there. Well, but it's different between the two. Like if I do a, if I do a seven minute high intensity workout, yeah, I, I feel something after, but it's a very different feeling than, than what I have going on mentally after a five hour endurance session. Um, yeah. And I, and I don't, I don't, I can't tell you what exactly, but mm-hmm. it's different. You have to, you have to try both to start to understand w- what you feel and what you like. Yeah. I think. I'm going to have to do some long, longer rucks. Um, that was kind of part of my plan anyway in the winter because what else are you going to do? Right. It's cold outside, but you could, I keep throw some clothes on and go for a ruck. Um, I wonder how similar. <laughs> Preaching to the choir. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah. I mean, whatever. <laughs> like if I go, if I go fishing for a day, I wonder how similar that feeling is like the clarity of like, like if you're out fishing and, and I don't get to do this as often as I used to, but where you're, you're there all day to where like you're hungry, you're tired. You don't want to stand yes. anymore. Um, yeah. You but then feel it's, a just, lot more it's just human. a good day. Yeah. It's just a good day. Yeah. You feel a lot more human when you, when you experience those things. Mm-hmm. I mean, we, we don't even understand what hunger is anymore, Nick, because yeah. eight feet away, there's something easy and already, already ready to go in our mouth. Yeah. I mean, it's not, it's not something that we experience like humans ever have before. Well, that was, the, still, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, oh, I was just going to say that was the one thing wearing that glucose, the glucometer, the, the Libre mm-hmm. thing you know, you're like, Oh, I'm eating pretty healthy and this, and, and I, like, you're wearing the things so you're paying attention a little bit. Right. But the number of spikes per day, if you just, if you're at home, like, I, I don't think, even though I wasn't making bad food choices, like it was often right. That you're getting these little glucose spikes and you're getting these insulin dumps. And, you know, if you had to work for that food, you wouldn't be getting the frequency right no, you just wouldn't. it would just you would wouldn't just be available to you yeah <laughs> there's such a large push yeah. of people preaching like if you're not eating every three hours then you're losing your muscles I think well that's... and you 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 should eat every three hours if you're actively on the move and doing a yeah. massive amount of work right. but if you're just sitting at your desk and you know there's no, no. reason to take a snack break no <laughs> right no none yeah and i think yeah. some of that gets lumped right back into that performance versus health right like mm-hmm you know, if you're trying to push to certain levels, then your nutrition is going to look a little different than if you're just hanging out at home. Right. Like it's yeah. so, yep. but the conversation gets so blended because ex bodybuilder that's in the gym for six hours eats every three hours. Well, mm-hmm. yeah, but. And then that's the person who's on YouTube that everybody saw the video of. It's like, Oh, well, I got to do that's that. That's what back. he does. Yeah. If that's yeah. what, if he's what he does, that's what I'm going to yeah. do. Oh, but, he also shoots up tests and is doing eight right. hours in the gym a day yeah, yeah. It's, it's we're talking about different animals and 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 yeah. different but ideas i think the standard american diet recommendations aren't like three meals a day plus one or two snacks like 
that's still you're consuming food four or five times a day you know yeah it's pretty yeah like if if you're not I, training oh yeah if you're not training the standard american diet is a great way to end up with diabetes not <laughs> i mean right the, the way the way that that has been has been constructed nick it it really is set up to oh. put people in a place where they have to rely on the medical system to keep them alive at that point. Yeah, yeah. that yeah. and the Half standard, American, the standard yeah. American diet of breakfast, lunch, and dinner are massive portions on top of it. So yeah. there's no reason to have those one or two snacks in between. Yeah, right. So I, kind of getting back to our roots makes it makes a ton of sense. And um, I've been doing the the little more fasting, and it's it's certainly an interesting. Like you yeah. think you're like, oh, I'm going to be starving. And that might be true for a day or two, but mm -hmm. you get a couple of days in and you get to this state of, of mental clarity. So this is an interesting thing because um, it's something I played around with as I was prepping for my uh, race this last summer, the Burning mm -hmm. River. And I played around with doing long distance fasted rucks. So I would how I'd fasted? Be 24 hours plus. Okay. So I'd, I'd be, I mean, you know, at that point, I'm, I'm not carrying muscle glycogen. Mm. I'm I've depleted that for sure and now I'm down to running on what my body can process as I run I did a 20 mile ruck without any without any food um in my system didn't care any food didn't eat any food I just drank water and electrolytes I was and if you're doing electrolytes yeah always electrolytes because I sweat a stupid amount um mm -hmm. but the end of that ruck I started to get to the point where I could feel things kind of starting to backfire on me um, and I, I think I, I ended up walking the last mile of it kind of as a cool down and kind of as an oh shit, um, because <laughs> that was, that was four hours. It was took me four hours and 20 minutes to do, um, 20 miles with like 45 pounds on my back. So that, that pursuit though, I can tell you an hour into that, I was in this zone, this mental zone, and I did not come out of it until I got to that last mile and I assessed and knew I had to change what I was doing. But I was in this state of kind of like mental clarity and awareness that you, you can't find unless you exert like that or unless you're fast and really doing both. I've never been in a state that was quite like that before. I've been in strange states fasting and I've been in strange states pushing endurance, but I haven't, I haven't had that unique combination of the two. It was, it was a very unusual um, clarity and high that I had for a long time. When you're doing that, what kind of heart rate are you sustaining? So that was, uh, I was trying to stay under 160 beats a minute and over 135. Um, so I guess that's zone three. Um, mm -hmm. But when you're talking yeah. about, when you're talking about prepping to do something for 18 hours, you don't want to touch zone four. Yeah. Um, once you start doing that, then you start, at least I have found that if I start knocking on zone four, I end up with some hard physiological stops that come up. And I, yeah. I, Every time I've done that, um, and it's been longer than a six-hour event, I I have to keep myself yeah, there, I mean, there's, there's, under that 160, 165 beats a minute. The, Otherwise, there's definitely fires. major nutritional differences between whether you're training at zone one versus zone two. Versus, yeah, yeah, as you go up, yeah, that's going to change. Right. Yeah. And so I wouldn't recommend doing sprint intervals that way. No, yeah, and you, I wouldn't have. I would have had a very unproductive sprint session yeah. that fasted, but I had a phenomenally productive endurance yeah. session, which you would think the opposite, right? You, you well, not necessarily yeah. the opposite, but you would think that you shouldn't go do, and you probably shouldn't go do a self-supported 20 mile rock fasted, but <laughs> I also- <laughs> We're had, not recommending this, people. <laughs> I, I also had built up that point. And, yeah. and I actually, I was carrying food. I did have yeah. a backup. So if I did have a real hard bonk, I did have some, some glucose I could toss right. in. Yeah. Um, but, it, but it was like, you don't know how that is going to go and what it does to you physically or mentally until you do it. And, mm -hmm. and it's just, you got to go out and accept the discomfort and just, just do it. And, yeah. and even just doing it, you have to be okay with it lasting three more hours because it took me the first hour to even get into that zone. And then I had the opportunity to use it and play with it for the next three hours. And that was the really cool part, but that takes commitment. It takes commitment and, and, and right. a want to be in that place where you get to find things out about yourself. Yeah. I, I hate to cut us off right now because this is a topic I actually really do enjoy, but unfortunately, Nick, I need to go you, treat somebody. You have to do real work. 
Hey guys, I hope you uh, enjoyed that episode. Uh, obviously, we got a little cut short. Uh, we ran up against a time limit with Kara's schedule, but um, a lot of interesting topics there as far as specificity of training. And I know we have plans to continue that conversation. I think it's actually scheduled for next week. Um, we're going to talk a little bit more about overtraining. So obviously in this journey that Phil has had, there's been some challenges, whether that's injuries or uh, feeling fatigued. Uh, there's some things to learn from here. And so we're going to try to, to build that within the conversation of, of what the average person needs and, and how does your training schedule need to look uh, when you factor in sleep and nutrition and stress and, and all those types of things. So we're going to try to dive into that topic a little more specifically on the next episode. So I hope you enjoy. Uh, if there's something you really uh, enjoyed, please leave us a comment. If you, know, you have a friend or family member that's also kind of on this journey to look to optimize their health and fitness, uh, please consider sharing this with them. We, you know, ultimately we want to reach more people and try to try to spread this message of, of best ways to move and feel. So, you know, if you can help us with that, man, we'd greatly appreciate it. Um, but otherwise hope you enjoyed and we will see you on the next episode.